church, let's stand together. We're going to sing some songs together this morning as we celebrate the coming and the birth of Jesus, our Prince of Peace.
us, God.
is so true. God, you are lovely, you are worthy, and you are so wonderful. And I pray that those truths would be deeply rooted in our hearts today, and that we would listen to what it is that you would like to say to us. We love you so much, God. so glad that you're here with us. Will you say hello to the people around you and then you may be seated. Well, good morning, Whittier Area Community Church. My name is Allie. I'm one of the pastors here and it is, it's so good to be with you, to worship Jesus together, whether you're right here in the auditorium with us or you're joining us online. Um, I doubt anyone's on the patio, but if you're on the patio, God bless you and welcome. Um, if you happen to be new here, we really wanna meet you. We wanna answer any questions you may have and just um, help you find a way to get connected into community here. And we have a space called Guest Central right outside these lobby doors and we have some friends in there that wanna give you a gift and just, just get to meet you. Um, you can join them after service, or if you're online, you can uh, click on the link the chat host drops in the box. Well, as you came in, you may have received one of these cards with our Christmas service times on there. We are going to be gathering to celebrate the coming of Emmanuel on Thursday, December 22nd at 7 p.m., Friday the 23rd at 7 p.m., and then on Christmas Eve, Saturday the 24th at 1, 3, and 5 with translation uh, available. Please consider who you're going to share this with. Um, I've learned sometimes the hard way that an invitation is necessary and it goes a long way. I had a neighbor across the street, elderly couple who had passed away, and their daughter came from Germany. She was a army nurse, and she came to get the house ready to sell, and I knew that they were a Mormon family, and so I really was just trying to be kind and loving. I didn't, didn't reach out and ask and invite her to church, but one day after we had been spending time packing up the house and talking, she said, do you, do you happen to know of a church around here? And I said, like a, like a Christian church? Or what kind of church would you like to, to worship at? And she's like, yeah, just a Christian church. And I said, yeah, I know of a great one. Would you, would you like to come on Sunday? And I said to her, I just didn't know. I didn't know if I should ask. And she's like, don't ever hesitate to ask. I was waiting for you to ask. And so there may be somebody in your life that's just waiting for you to ask. So share this card with them. Invite them to Christmas. And with that in mind, we are going to have some adjustments coming up because of Christmas services. Uh, on December 18th, it's going to be our first Sunday without the 5 p.m. service, okay? So next Sunday, December 18th, no 5 p.m. service. Our creative team is going get, to be getting the space ready to celebrate Jesus those following days. And then on December 25th, Christmas morning, which lands on a Sunday, we want to be intentional about uh, creating space for you to be with your family and to not necessarily be leaving your home. So stay in your PJs, open gifts, and you can join us online. There will be a service available for you online at uh, WAC.TV and YouTube. And then on January 1st, the first day of 2023, you can join us back here on campus. We'll have our 8 a.m. service in the chapel, and then we're going to have one service, one special service at 10 a.m., and that will be available here on campus and then online as well. And many of you know, if you've served at Christmas before, it is magical to be a part of welcoming people here on our campus. Whether it's smiling and just saying we're glad you're here, or if you're at the hot cocoa bar making sure the little ones don't pile on too many marshmallows, it's wonderful to take part in that opportunity. So if you would love to serve this year, we need you and we want you. You can go to whack.net forward slash serve church. We are continuing to celebrate what God has done in 2022 and truly, it's immeasurable. But this week, we want to celebrate what he's done in our grow groups and in our communities where we experience discipleship with one another in relationships. So as I go through these, these slides and we celebrate, just remember each one is a person, is a man, a woman, a child that God is after. They're after their hearts, and they've responded to that. So we have a program called Next Steps, and we saw 185 people go through Next Steps and learn more about our church and how to get connected there. And then we have our grow groups and our small groups, community groups, and support groups where we saw people come and um, just experience vulnerability and growth and relationships. We have um, our community groups, MOPS. We have adult Sunday school, Bible study, and then a marriage core came back on campus this year where people were seeking um, healthier relationships and connection. 
Then we have an incredible program, our internship program, where we had 12 young adults go through that. Um, and they gave thousands of hours volunteering their time and serving this church. And then we had our, our youth, our next gen, our early childhood, all of these spaces where we saw kids served and hear the gospel. This, these kids went to camp this year. We had high school, junior high, and elementary school camp. And then we had one of the biggest VBSs ever on our campus this summer. And to make that happen, did somebody clap? No, I think that was just me. Oh, okay, let's clap. <laughs> I heard one clap and you never wanna let that person hang alone, so. And then we had so many volunteers make that possible. And I think the number that we should clap for again is that 77 kids decided to follow Jesus. One of the groups that I wanna highlight is especially dear to me, those are our support groups. And this is a place every Monday night at 6.30 where anybody is welcome to come. You come as you are. And we have 12 different support groups and I want you to meet my friends, uh, Norma and Tony, as they share a little bit about their experience. A lot of people, they don't know, or they don't understand what the supporting groups mean. Supporting group means that we're gonna support them in any uh, problems that they have. A lot of people, when they heard supporting groups, they refer everything to addictions. But remember, the supporting group is not just for the people that has addictions. It's for the family members and friends of people that has addictions. Also, not just addictions, is that you have depression, that you have stress, that you have a background from your childhood. There is a lot of, a lot of uh, issues that we can have, and we can help in these supporting groups. Our experiences brought us to uh, 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 lead uh, groups here in Spanish and in English, dealing with uh, either addictions or, or basically habits that some people may have, and, and we are so grateful that, that we're given that opportunity to lead. It's been really good, and we've been involved in this program for a few years, and it's been helping us as a couple, as a myself, a lot. So I've been growing a lot in taking all those angers and all those bad things that I have in my heart, sticking it out, because I've been healing from a lot of things in my past, in my childhood. The holiday seasons are the most happiest days of the, of the year to be in. They're just wonderful. However, they can bring on a lot of painful memories. We all need one place that we can count on, that we can say we are here, where, where there's a group that not only will, will focus on, on, on a situation that a person may have, but also that whatever is said or brought on to the, to the group, it's all uh, anonymous. We really, really, invite you to come and, and come and find out what is this supporting groups about. Anyone that, that has any situations in their life, that, then you can join us. We want them. I think most of us would uh, benefit from a space like this, or we, we love someone and care about somebody who would. Um, so. Come as you are on Monday nights, 6.30 in the chapel for worship and prayer and short message. And then we'll have 12 different groups we break off into for those living with addiction, grief, have experienced divorce. I'm really excited to share that in 2023, we're going to have a women's mental well, mental health, guess what I'm trying to say, wellness, health, combined, makes wealth. Mental wealth is good. Um, in 2023, we have a men's mental health group as well. So join us. We would love to see you there. Um, now, as we turn to a time of giving, uh, I want to highlight that if you received one of these envelopes, this is for our special Christmas offering. And this is going to go to our global partners in Y Malawi, caring for those who are experiencing food insecurities. They are farming people and are predicting to experience floods this season, and it's going to make it even more challenging for them. So we want to be intentional about setting aside this Christmas offering for them to help meet their needs. So bow your heads with me as we pray and thank God for these gifts we're about to give. Father, we thank you so much for the gift of life, Lord, for the gift of breath and everything that you've given us. It's all from you. And so as we give joyfully and sacrificially, Lord, we just pray that you would expand it beyond our wildest dreams. 
beyond what we can ask or imagine, that the name of Jesus will be praised and the needs of your world will be met. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, everything during this season of the year seems to be wrapped in lights. Our houses are wrapped in lights. Uh, trees are wrapped in lights. Cars can be wrapped in lights. You get a traffic ticket if you drive with them. But uh, bikes are wrapped in lights. Boats can be wrapped in lights. And this year, I learned that beards can be wrapped in lights. <laughs> if you're sporting a beard out there 
you got to know there are a number of beardaments that exist these days to really brighten up your Christmas season. Uh, and even our sermon series uh, this year is wrapped in lights. It's called The Light of Christmas as we're discovering that the lights around us this time of year are not meant to just be sentimental or ornamental. They're supposed to be fundamental reminders of what happened that very first Christmas. And here's how the gospel writer Matthew describes it. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And that light was a person. His name was Jesus. And John, one of his disciples, said he was the true light that gives light to everyone. He came into the world. And when he came into the world, John says, in him was life, eternal life. And that life was the light of all mankind. And then here's this promise we looked at last week. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. The darkness can't contain it. The darkness can't stop it. That first Christmas, we were celebrating that the God of the universe who said, let there be light, sent his son to the world, who claimed, I am the light, and then Jesus looked at his followers, which means if you are someone today and you say, Jesus is my savior, he looks at you now and says, now you're the light. Of all the millions of metaphors Jesus could have given, he looks at his followers and says, I want you to be light. You've been given the responsibility to shine with the goodness and love and service of who our God is in this dark world. You don't have to be perfect to do this. You just have to be bright. And last week, we talked about how sometimes doing this can be reminiscent of a light bulb, where a light bulb has this thread inside this filament that seems so invisible and seems so fragile until it's connected to a power source and then it lights up in a way that can change an environment. And so I was encouraged last week watching many of you, you, you made the connection and you said, God, I want to be that this season. And you took a light bulb like this in the lobby of our worship center and you wrote a name on it. And then you put that in the wall. You took off a sticker, screwed it in the wall and it lit up. And uh, this past week, I've spent a few times just walking past those lights and seeing the names written there. And I'd encourage you today, if you wrote, put a name in there, find it today. Pray again over a God, would you use me to bring the light this season to these folks? Because that's our job description. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. So in other words, don't hide your light, let it shine. Now, today I wanna talk with you about a song that maybe you might have sung when you were growing up that was like reminiscent of those words. I'm trying to remember if you can help me with it. It goes, this little light of mine. You got it, that's right. Whenever a preacher starts trying to sing up in front, I always cringe. So if you cringe right now, I'm with you. And you're like, make this short, John, make this short. Um, but then there's the second verse to the song that's really kind of the focus for today. It goes, hide it under a bushel. I love it. And then it says, I'm gonna let it shine. And what I love about it is when we're kids and you learn that, those words, it's like when you get to the no part, you have to like emphatically yell, no which is funny to me, because as adults, we never teach kids like what bushels actually are. <laughs> so kids know for sure, like I know I'm against bushels and I'm gonna yell it emphatically when they say a bushel, but if I ever came across a bushel, I'm not sure I could identify it. Um, so if you're here today and you've spent your whole life wondering like I, I've never learned, today is the day. You will learn what a bushel is. Uh, a bushel, as some of you know, was a measurement that was used throughout the centuries for grain and crops, and the measurement was often a bucket or a basket, so that's what's become synonymous in songs like this. So uh, a bushel, a basket, a bucket, it's a container. And I bring that up as we start today because I need you to understand that in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus seems to imply that there are certain ways that your light can be contained. The light that shines in the darkness, the darkest can't overcome. It can be contained by certain forces in our lives. And today I wanna talk to you about one specific force that I think threatens to contain the light of what God wants to do in your life more than any other container. And it is a force that shows up in the Christmas story. 
and it is called fear. The cover or container that I think many of us allow our light to be kind of put out by or covered by is fear. And that's all over Christmas. Now, whenever you probably think of the Christmas story, you don't think of fear. You think of glad tidings and great joy for all people. But if you read the Christmas story in Matthew 1 and Luke 1 and 2, you discover the command that comes up more than any other command is do not be afraid. Why? Because fear can be one of the primary forces that covers the light that shines in you and me. We have lots of fears about whether God's gonna use us. We have fears like I'm not enough or I'm not ready to be a light or I'm not worthy to be a light. That's how some of the central characters in the Christmas story felt. I think all these central characters, they had to battle fear. That's why every time the angel Gabriel would show up and he'd meet Zechariah or Mary or Joseph or the shepherds, the, one of the first statements he made was, do not be afraid. And when you look at these encounters, I think the fear went deeper than meeting some heavenly emissary. I think the fear went to some deep things inside of them that threaten for their light not to shine. And so today, I wanna look at the fears that each one of these people faced. And the last couple moments, I'd like to unpack them with you. The four fears that show up in the Christmas story. And I wanna look at these fears and answer the question, how can you overcome your fear so that your light will shine bright this Christmas? Because again, you're the light of the world. Uh, we'll be in four passages today, but they're really just two chapters in the Bible. So Luke chapter one, five through 20, if you have your Bible, and then we'll go to Luke 1, 26 through 38. And then we'll skip over to Matthew 1, 18 through 21, and then we'll go back to Luke two. So just put your finger in Matthew one and Luke one, and you'll be set to go. Uh, we're starting in Luke chapter one, where we meet the first character in the Christmas story who's told, do not be afraid. And some of you know who this is. He's an elderly man named Zechariah. And the fear that Zechariah battled was this. He feared, I'm not remembered by God. More specifically, my prayers will never be answered. Let, let's read this in Luke chapter one, starting in verse, uh, Luke chapter one, starting in verse five. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, ob observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as a priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. And when the time for burning incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel says, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you're to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. And we'll pause there for a moment. This very first do not be afraid comes to an elderly priest. Zechariah and his wife were described in three ways in this passage. They're both righteous, they're both childless, and they're both very old. And this meant for years they knew the deep ache of what it was like to pray to God for something and to not receive it. Battling infertility for years, you can imagine day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, they prayed, God, would you bring us a child? Would you allow that to be possible? But years went by, decades went by, and they ultimately got crushed to disappointment. Zechariah, I think their passionate prayers that he prayed, they stopped. So much so that when literally there's a supernatural intervention and an angel says, God heard your prayers, Zechariah doesn't believe it. He gave up hope on that a long time ago. Again, his light was being covered by this bushel, this fear that I'm not remembered by God. And I don't think he's the only one who experiences this fear. 
I think there's many of us, even though we might not think of it right away, one of our greatest fears is that, God, I will pray for you to come through and you will never come through for me in the way I'm asking. That's, some of you are here today at church and you're thinking, man, God has still not answered this prayer that I've been praying for years. Why, why is God not, is God not listening? Does God not care? Have I offended God in some way? It, it can be very easy, I think, to lose hope when time passes and it seems like prayers go unanswered. You're praying for restoration in a relationship and it feels like things keep getting worse and worse. You're praying for your health to be restored and it feels like doctors still can't figure this out. You're praying for a transformation in a family member that they'll turn one direction and it feels like they've gone further the other direction. And sometimes after weeks or months or even years of committed prayer, it is natural for us to get discouraged. And yet, The angel says to Zechariah, God has heard your prayers. Do you believe that? Zechariah didn't believe that. Look at verse 18, how he responds. He asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm old. My wife is old. I love how Eugene Peterson puts this in the message paraphrase. Do you expect me to believe this? After this, you expect me to believe I would never, I was thinking this week, I read that and I'm thinking, I would never say something like that to an angel, would you? I mean, and yet the hypocrisy within me is I I think those things all the time about God. I think, God, why is your timing like this? Why isn't your provision like that? God, are you good in this? Because this is is, is not working out right now. And and I think, friends, we all at different times battle this this question of, God, do you hear me? Do you care? Am I forgotten? And if you want to know what's what's the antidote, how do I deal with that bushel, that basket being put over my light, that fear? I, I think it's found in what the angel says next. The angel said to him, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news And now you're going to be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which come true at their appointed time. You see, I'd suggest to you, this sounds simplistic, so just stick with me. The antidote to this whole bushel of fear that you're not going to be remembered is right there, the thing Zechariah wouldn't do. It's to believe the words that God had spoken. Whenever your prayers are not being answered in your time, whenever the outcome isn't occurring in your way, whenever provision isn't appearing yet, the crucial question you have to answer is, do I still believe God's word? Because if I believe God's word, that means God is still working out things for my good, that his promise will never fail, that he is wiser than I am, and that he will bring all things to redemption. He will make all things new. You see, even when I don't understand, even when my prayers aren't being answered, do I believe what God has said? And if you're thinking, but, but I don't understand. Why don't I understand what God's saying? Here's a hard truth. God is less interested in you understanding him and more interested in you trusting him. Because ultimately, the way that you overcome discouragement and the fear of unanswered prayer is to believe that God is still who he says he is, and he will still do everything he has promised to do, no matter what things look like today. So I wanna challenge you today. If, If your light is being contained by this idea that I'm not remembered by God, don't believe the lie of that bushel. Because as the angel told Zechariah, God has heard your prayers, and he will come through. Second, Fear, we see in the Christmas story, is this. My light won't shine because I'm not enough. I don't have what it takes for the purpose that God has for me. This, this fear stems from seemingly impossible circumstances. And the one who I think we see this in is Mary. Uh, you see Mary's story in Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. Luke writes, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, because she did get pregnant, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. 
Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? It's not an elderly priest this time. It's a young teenager that an angel comes to. And again, how does Mary respond? She's troubled, greatly troubled. Zechariah was distressed and concerned and troubled at first, but for different reasons. Because it's not just the intimidating angel, it's now this intimidating future that's planned. Mary's engaged. She's supposed to get married. There's a wedding ahead. There's this whole life with Joseph. There's kids she's gonna have with Joseph. And suddenly now, a miracle child's gonna come? If, if I was Mary, I don't know about you, I'd be panicking. I'd be thinking all these different questions. What will my parents say? Will Joseph still wanna marry me? What will people say about me behind my back? Will anyone believe the crazy story? Will this be the death of my reputation? And yet, here's what's so amazing about Mary to me. She's not questioning any of those things right here. She's not worried about her reputation, her relationships, people's responses, she asks one question, and it's a technical question. How will this be since I'm a virgin? Mary's question is not about believability. It's about biology. She's not saying, I'm not going to participate. She's saying, with me, I don't know how this is practical. See, her fear is that the impossible, God who can do impossible, couldn't possibly use her. Speaking candidly, she says, I've never been with a man. I kind of, I know how this works. I, I don't have what's needed for this. Zechariah, again, Zechariah, his question is if this is possible. Mary's question is how this is possible with her. She was afraid how it could be possible. Could, could God do this with somebody like her? Would she be enough for the assignment? And I wanna just pause and turn that back on you. Because I think there's some of you here today and you think God answers prayers and God can do the impossible, but the limitation is you in your mind. You're thinking, but God couldn't do the impossible with me. There's situations, God, God, God has heaven created and, and God's gonna restore me with my loved one one day, but I'm weak. Can, can God really sustain me for the rest of my life until I, and I, I reach that day again? Maybe for some of you, you're caring for a loved one who's sick or you're caring for a loved one with specialized needs, and you're thinking, man, I, I don't know if I'm strong enough. God, you can use me to do this. Maybe for some of you, it's getting out of years of debt. You know God owns all the resources in the universe, but man, I keep messing this up. Or maybe you're trying to heal from abuse or overcome a, a, a fear. Whatever it is, sometimes we can feel like, God, you can do the impossible, but it's not possible through me. And if that's where you are, Again, you're not gonna try to figure God out. The antidote to getting rid of that bushel that says, I'm not enough, is actually acceptance. It's accepting this, that God can do impossible things through imperfect people. And that's what the angel essentially tells Mary. Look at verse 37. No word from, the God, no word from God will ever fail. Nothing is impossible with God. And so what does Mary then do at that point? She says, I am the Lord's servant, May your word be to me be fulfilled. I love this. Your word to me, to me. The me that feels like I'm not enough. The me that feels like I'm more of an impediment to this impossible plan. The me that feels like, man, I, I don't have what it takes. I'll be the servant. And you need to know if you feel like that's you today or you feel like I'm not enough to shine and for to be used. Friends, God does not look for those who have it all. God looks for those who are willing to just surrender it all, and then he does impossible things with people who are considered insufficient. Don't believe the lie that I'm not enough and let that bushel cover your, your light. You're, you're never gonna be insufficient if God is with you. Well, maybe for you, it's not the fear of I'm not remembered or I'm not enough. The third fear, though, that shows up in this story is one I think we all can relate to, and it's the fear that I'm not ready. 
You see, the future feels way too uncertain to let my light shine right now. Things in this world have been uncertain all throughout the world history since sin entered the world, but the last couple of years have shown us this especially. And at times we're afraid what's gonna come next. And the person I think who embodies this in the Christmas story is a man named Joseph. Matthew writes about him in Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 21. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Again, it happened. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Joseph, he was a man who wanted to be faithful to the law, and yet he's put in this impossible situation where his wife is, his future wife is pregnant, and it's not from him, and now he has to process, what do I do? And he's probably struggling with questions like, what, what, what's the right decision? And do I do this quietly and leave her? And what if I do marry her? And, and what if people shun us and they kick us out? And how am I gonna provide for my family? And where am I gonna go? And what does the future hold for us? And questions like that, they can paralyze us. So how does Joseph overcome this fear of not being ready, not know what's coming next? Well, God is so gracious. Again, after he considered this, verse 20, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Don't be afraid to do the next right thing, Joseph, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you're to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. The angel says, Joseph, don't be afraid to do the right next thing. Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. There's no guarantee that things ahead are gonna be easy. There's no guarantee of what the consequences are gonna be. But Joseph, obey anyway. Obey anyway. Do what God is asking you to do, even when the outcome is uncertain. And this is how you overcome that bushel that says, I'm not ready. Joseph overcame his fear by obeying even when the outcomes were not clear. Are you willing to do that? The whole picture is not clear in front of you yet. But you know, okay, God, you've illuminated the right next step. I'll obey. There, there's an old Irish blessing that says this. May you see God's light on the path ahead when the road you walk is dark. And in my experience, God's path on the light ahead is usually just a little bit in front of you. He usually doesn't give you a couple miles down the road. You've got to obey. I'm going to take the next step. And I'm gonna believe even though I don't feel ready for this. And when you do this, friends, that bushel of fear begins to diminish. As Corey Ten Boom says, you never have to be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. For any of you here today afraid of what's gonna come and I'm not ready, you are ready just to take another step of obedience like Joseph did and God will use that little step and that fear will not stop your light. Well, one more fear before we finish. The final fear of this story that I think has to be battled so the light of Christmas could shine is this, I'm not worthy. And we find this fear in the life of a group of people known as the shepherds. So back to Luke chapter two, uh, verse 18. We read this, and there were shepherds out in the fields nearby keeping their watch a flock by night. This is verse eight, not 18, sorry. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But angels said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Messiah, the, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. And suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Story four, the shepherds had to fight fear. Now, in the Christmas cards, the shepherds are usually seen as these sentimental, cute little guys, you know, with their staffs and the precious moments lambs. But in order to understand the fear, you need to understand who these shepherds were. We don't know their names. We don't know how many of them were, are, there were. 
but we do know that shepherds in the first century were seen as common, humble laborers who were on the outside fringes of society. They were considered outsiders. They, they weren't revered. They weren't trusted. In fact, we've talked about this before. They were not trusted to testify in any court case. Society had made it clear to shepherds, you are not worthy. You're a group of people who are not important. You don't give, you're not given important jobs. You're not given important announcements. But that's why it's so beautiful that in the Christmas story, God wants to visit this group of people considered unworthy. And not just with one angel, did you catch that? There's a great company of heavenly hosts that appears. This, these, this term heavenly host would often describe stars in the sky. So you gotta imagine, they have just a sky, a sky full of angels in front of them. And, and if you gotta think how startling that was. Mary, Joseph, Zechariah, they got one angel and they freaked out. How do you take in a whole sky full of angels? But again, that environment wasn't the only thing they were afraid of. I think, again, deeper down, they were afraid that they were not worthy. And that is why the message the angel gives is so beautiful. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for who? All the people. For all the people. The God of the universe is sending his son as a helpless baby so that you can know this is accessible to all the people. The shepherds have lived their life probably believing that God only came for the put together and the perfect and the religiously respectable. And so this is a new and radical message that God is for everyone, for all the people. And that is why Luke says the shepherds hurried to go see that baby lying in a manger. Despite their fears of feeling unworthy, they needed to see for themselves, is there really a God who would bring peace to everyone? And after this encounter, that bushel of fear was removed and instead it was replaced with courage, the courage to testify about this. Look at the final verses here, verse 17, 18. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them. And it's just not just amazing what they said, it's amazing that they were the ones saying it. God called these people who couldn't testify in court to be the first testimony about this, this new child who had been born. And, and friends, even though they were unworthy, they found courage because of grace. And I, I wanna challenge you this Christmas, if you feel like, man, I, I could never shine for God because I'm unworthy and I'm ashamed and my past is too broken, can I remind you that God removes that bushel of unworthiness by promising, I have come to bring good news of great joy for all people. People with pasts like yours, people with complicated circumstances like yours, people who other people maybe have mistreated like you, God wants to actually bring his love to you and then use you to bring that love to others. I don't know what fears you're struggling with today. For some of you, it might be, I'm not remembered and I, I don't feel like God's answering my prayers. For others of you, it might be, I'm not enough and it would be impossible for God to use me. I'm not ready, the future's too uncertain, I'm not worthy. I don't know what your fear is, but I do know that if you let that fear continue to have space in your life, your light is not gonna shine. That fear will contain it. But the promise of Christmas is that the darkness it cannot overcome the light. And as intimidating as the darkness looks, it cannot contain the light. So fight those fears today, friends. Fight those fears. In order to do that, you gotta believe. Believe God's word even when you feel forgotten. And accept God's job for you even when you feel inadequate. And obey even when you can't see the outcomes. Just do the right next, next right thing and then be courageous even when you think, man, no one would believe what I have to say. Oh, God's given you a message to share. You are the light of the world. Hide it under a bushel. Let me give you one more chance. You gotta, let's do this. Now you know what a bushel is, so you're ready, okay? Hide it under a bushel. No. I'm gonna let it shine. And... uh 
as we close right now, we get to, we get to celebrate communion that the only reason the light shines in us is because the light of the world, Jesus, he died on a cross for our sins. And so as you take out the elements, I just wanna give you a moment to bow in prayer and to connect with him before we, we, we share in this, this bread and juice together. So would you bow in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that your love for us is, is provided through Jesus. And as we're here today, God, we acknowledge that we have said things, we've done things, we've lived with attitudes that, that we know that those don't honor you. We come to you for your grace right now and we ask for your forgiveness. And we thank you for it. God, we know that we are your children because of what Jesus did. So as we take this bread and this cup, would you fill us with your spirit in a fresh way today, God? So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body for you. Eat this and remember me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant. It's my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink this and remember me. For whenever we eat that bread and we drink that cup, we remember the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, the resurrection of Jesus from the tomb, and the return of Jesus that one day will deal with darkness once and for all and will bring light to everything. Well, as you leave today, um, if you need prayer, there's gonna be a team online and at the front of the auditorium who would love to pray for you. Uh, if you wanna give to the benevolent offering, that'll be available through baskets at the door online. We do that when we take communion to care for those in need. And then finally, as you're leaving today, if you haven't written a name on a light bulb yet and, and screwed that, plugged that into the lobby, we'd invite you, go do that today uh, or go pray over some of those names in the lobby. And then don't forget to take this card and invite someone uh, so that your light can shine this Christmas. God bless you. Hope you have a great week, everyone.